It's good to see everyone this morning, and I trust you've had a blessed week. We uh, return to our uh, text for our uh, sermon series from uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 23, which uh, where Paul reveals uh, fruit of the Spirit. And uh, we have spent uh, a few weeks there already. To, uh, we finish up here in a few weeks, but uh, this morning... Uh, you want to turn there and I hope you've marked that text, highlighted or underlined it, uh, underlined or done something to it to kind of uh, accent it for yourselves so you will have a, a quick reference to it. But it's such a beautiful uh, verse of scripture, verses 22 and 23 in chapter 5 of Galatians where Paul writes, But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. This morning we focus our attention on goodness. Now, you may or may not, I, I, I don't recall if I've ever told this little anecdote before, but you, if you have, just listen anyway. But uh, I heard about a, a lady who was having trouble with her little boy, and uh, uh, he just wouldn't behave himself. And so uh, she did everything she th- thought she could to kind of correct him and and it just wasn't working. And so finally he came to her and he said, uh, uh, Mama, I'll be good for a dollar. And she said, well, why don't you be like your daddy and be good for nothing? Uh, maybe you've heard it. Maybe you've said it. Maybe you've had it said about you. He's a good man. She's a good woman. We... Uh, we hear those things, we say those things, and what do we mean by them? I mean, it's not uncommon. We just all have a perhaps a different way of thinking about it when you hear that phrase. He's a good man, she's a good woman. Are we talking about someone who is morally upright? Someone who does all the, all the good things that we think good people ought to do? Or are we talking about someone who does good deeds? Are we talking about one who does the right things in the right way for the right reasons to the right end? You know, get a lot of right in there. Well, the Bible uses the idea or the term good or goodness hundreds of times. Literally hundreds of times throughout both the Old and the New Testament. It describes creation, it describes men and women, it describes the deeds of men and women. It, it, it's just used extensively throughout the Bible. In the book of Psalms, chapter 14, first three verses, the psalmist wrote these words, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned aside, he says, and they have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Elijah was referenced this morning relative to his belief that he was the only one in all of Egypt, that, or all, excuse me, all of Israel who had kept the Lord's commandments. Here, the psalmist says no one's done it. No one one has been good. No one is good. No one does good. But as we think about this in light of the text, we understand that goodness is viewed here as a quality that is really, really significant and important. And the Apostle Paul singles it out with these nine other aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. And so we begin with the same questions and look at the same questions that we've asked about each one of these Ideas concerning a part of the fruit of the Spirit. And the first question is, what is it? What, what is this goodness that's being spoken of here? Well, it comes from a word which means good or useful or fitting or beneficial. It's, it's kind of uh, like having something that, that helps you, if you will. And I suppose that could be an individual or be a, it could be a thing. It could be a tool even. Something that helps. But in a moral sense, we think of it as someone who is upright and Kind and just and even generous. And you're going to see that idea of generosity show up a lot as we talk about this particular word. In terms of our conscience, 
When we think about goodness, we think about having a clear conscience. Someone who is good has a clear conscience and isn't worried about what people might find out about him or her if they start digging around looking for skeletons in the closet, so to speak. From a practical standpoint, it is this quality that gives a a behavioral aspect to our lives where we choose to do the godly or the righteous thing or where we choose to do the beneficial or the generous thing. And so there are lots of aspects to this that are really important to us. Now, when we think about generosity, we understand it to be the willingness to share what one has for the benefit to and the blessings of others. This word is... uh, kind of immersed, the, the, the word goodness here in this text, it's kind of immersed, if you will, it's baptized in the whole idea of generosity. And as I mentioned, we'll see that a little bit more clearly as we go along. So that's what this word goodness is, the goodness that Paul speaks of in this text. Well, in following our questions then, how do we see goodness evidenced in Jesus' life? Well, I want to give you a realistic perspective of it. There's a story from the life of Jesus that gives us some uh, a view of it that we perhaps have never seen or thought about before, and it's found in the book of Mark. Uh, Mark, beginning with in chapter ten, beginning with verse seventeen. Now the account there, as we if we were to read the entire text, we would discover that this person that has approached Jesus, we come to know him as the rich young ruler. The Bible doesn't say all those things about him, but it does refer to him as being rich. But in verses seventeen and eighteen of Mark chapter ten, here's what it says. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Now, I'm going to suggest that that phrase means he was young because not too many of us who are older can run anywhere, and we're certainly not going to run somewhere and fall on our knees. That's the last thing. You might trip and fall on your knees, but that's not something you plan to do. But a man ran to Jesus and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Now, we get so caught up in what Jesus actually tells this young man that we don't spend a lot of time talking about these particular two verses relative to the goodness that is being ascribed to Jesus by this individual. Calling Jesus good. Jesus said, uh, why are you calling me good? No one's good but God. We ought to understand that. And so the next time we think about calling someone a good man or good woman, maybe we should think about what Jesus said here. No one's good but God. It's a quality of perfection, he says, reserved for God alone. Now, Jesus was not saying, I am not good. That's what a lot of people would say. You know, if Jesus is correcting this fellow and saying, uh, you shouldn't call me good, then then that means he's not good. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. Jesus is saying this. He's saying, do you you realize that if you call me good, you're calling me God? Good teacher. Jesus says, no one's good but God. So if you call me good teacher, then you are calling me God. And that's, that's a whole different so to speak, a can of worms to open relative to theology. You want to get into it. Jesus says, if you call me good, you're calling me God. When we were in college, Janice and I, we sang with a a, a PR team, a group called the Christian Minstrels, and uh, we traveled to churches and camps and did all kinds of uh, special uh, uh, singing uh, engagements. But we had a song in our repertoire called Everywhere He Went. Now, some of you may have heard that song from back in the 70s, Everywhere He Went, He Was Doing Good. And it goes through a a list of all the things that Jesus did while he was here on earth. And it's just a really, really great kind of catchy tune. It's one of our favorite songs to sing. Everywhere he went, he did did good. And the people of Jesus' day that encountered him and got to know him and experience him, they thought the same thing. In Mark chapter 7, verse 37, it says, The people were overwhelmed with amazement and said, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Now the word well here is not the same word that we have for goodness, but it is the same idea. It refers to godly action for the benefit of others. And that's what this whole idea of goodness is trying to kind of convey to us. Godly action for the benefit of others. And so when someone says by they, they possess a part of the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit has produced goodness in them, in them they're, they're actually trying to bless other people with their efforts. And that's basically what it means. 
Now, when you think about the examples of Jesus as we, relative to this idea, Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 give us a, a, a nice picture. So if you want to turn and read that, we'll read that together. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Another time he went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. And some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. Now, when we say some of them, keep in mind that the some of them is lo- most likely Pharisees and all these religious types. Now, it doesn't say it in the verses that we're going to read uh, from that text, but a little farther down, both in the context here, both of uh, Mark chapter 3 and I think it's Matthew chapter 11 that records the same, same account, it tells us that we're talking about the Pharisees, okay? Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, Which is lawful on the Sabbath? In other words, what's, it, what's legally permissible for us to do on this particular day? What's lawful on the Sabbath? Then Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus said to them, excuse me, which is which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill, but they remained silent. So Jesus presents them with an interesting question here. What's lawful on the Sabbath? What's the right thing to do on the Sabbath? What can you do? What can you legally get away with and what's the right thing to do? Is it right to do good or is it right to do, is it better to do evil? Is it right to save life or to take life? But notice what what the Bible says there at the end of verse 4, but they remain silent. Now I want to point out here that their silence is telling. Because the Bible says at the the end of that section there, the end of that text, the the idea there is that from that point forward, the Pharisees began to plot, uh, plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. And so they didn't like what had happened there. They didn't say anything about it, but from that moment forward, they went out trying to kill him. Now, as I mentioned, their silence is telling. And so as I thought about that, here's what I wondered. Did they not know what was good? When Jesus says, which is, which is right, is it, is it, what's the right thing to do here? Is it, is it all right to do good? Now, come on. Every red, red-blooded Jewish boy knew what was good. He had learned it from the time he was in his mother's arms as a babe. And he knew, they knew what was good. They just weren't responding, which is, which is so interesting. Did they not know? Of course they knew. Did they would not want to admit what was good? I think that bumps up against the answer. I'm just not going to say anything about this. I'm not going to give Jesus the benefit of the doubt of being right in this situation. Because if I, if I do, if we do, then it looks like we're pairing ourselves up with him and we're, we're condoning his teaching. So we're not going to say anything. Or, and as I thought a little bit more about this, I thought maybe, maybe they didn't want Jesus to define or demonstrate what was good. We want to define what's good. We don't want you doing it. You know, we can say what's right and what's wrong. You don't get that option. Uh, we can say what someone should do on this day and what someone shouldn't do, and we don't want to see you doing anything to the contrary. So maybe that's what's happening here. But, but I think that's a, a great place for us to look to see that they didn't understand anything about real goodness. But Jesus is trying to, to assert what it is and then model it, if you will. Then if you look at his teachings, just a moment, in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, Matthew chapters chapters 5 through 7, 11 times in those chapters Jesus refers to something as good. I think he does that because he wants to stress the importance of the things that are good. You know, the things that are important are the things that we, we find ourselves talking about most often, aren't they? Or at least that we're most seriously engaged in conversation about the things that are important. And so Jesus talks about things in those, in those chapters that are good. Or how about over in John chapter 10? This is another good one. John chapter 10, beginning with verse 11, where Jesus asserts some things about himself. John 10, beginning with verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. I'm not just any shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. I'm not just the shepherd that everyone thinks I ought to be. I'm the good shepherd. And he qualifies that by saying the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. 
If you want to know how to define someone as the good shepherd, or you want to find out how to uh, describe how someone is really good, then think about that. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And he goes on to say the hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees a wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then when the wolf attacks and the flocks uh, attacks the flock and scatters it, the man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus says this in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. So when, when the wolf comes, the good shepherd doesn't run away. And the sheep don't run away from the shepherd either. They know which shepherd to follow when tough times come about. It's here in this when the wolf shows up. Three times Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd in this text, this this section. He describes his shepherding position and his works, the promises he makes, and the the way he provides protection and the way he offers anything that is needed by the sheep, he provides for them. And so you get this, at least this image of Jesus here relative to the whole concept of goodness, as Paul has uh, listed it, as a part of the fruit of the Spirit. So let's answer the third question then. Why does Paul hold goodness in such high esteem? What makes this such a big deal for him? Well, there are a few reasons I want to suggest to you. And I want to begin by saying Paul sees goodness as a fulfillment of his prayer to God. When he's, when he's praying, he, he understands that goodness plays a role in this. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11, he says this, With this in mind, We constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. Uh, Paul thought of himself and was indeed, in fact, a spiritual father to so many among so many churches in the first century, early first uh, century, the early life of the church. And one of the things that he really tried to draw out as much as as possible among all those people in all those places was goodness. There's a practice of goodness here. There's something about being morally upright and at the same time being uh, outwardly focused on, on helping other folk, if you will. Moral excellence as well as good or helpful behavior is how we would describe it. So Paul sees this whole concept of, I'm praying for you so that you might be not only a good person, but a a righteous and generous kind of person relative to this. Now, also we can say about Paul as we think about this whole idea of how he holds this in high esteem. Notice how he pairs, uh, pairs goodness together with other Christian characteristics and qualities. Now, uh, how many of you believe this? You, you know people by the company they keep. I see a few hands. I see a, now, all of us probably think it. We, we might not want to say it, but most of us think that we can usually judge people on the basis of the company they keep. Do you know that words are like that? Words in the scripture are like that? You can judge whether or not a word is good by the company it keeps, by the other words that's used in it. And Paul uses this word goodness or the idea of goodness in a couple of other texts that really help us in this regard. The first one is found in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 9. And here's what he says. For the fruit of light, which is similar to the fruit of the Holy Spirit obviously, the fruit of light, light consists in all three things. Goodness righteousness, and truth. And so Paul is tying goodness to righteousness and truth, saying, if you, you know, if you want to see how these things, words function, we put them together with other words, and we have righteousness and truth as a big player along with goodness. Isn't that a great idea? One more. Romans chapter 15, verse 14. Paul wrote this, I, am, I myself am convinced, my brothers, that you yourselves are, are full of goodness, okay? So he's going to pair it with something, because we already said he would. Goodness, complete in knowledge, and competent to instruct one another. And so here, he ties it to the whole idea of being complete in knowledge and competent to instruct other people. So look look at the company, the word 
goodness keeps, not to mention all the other good things that we see it listed with there in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, that long list of, of nine, a total of nine things there. And so Paul pairs it with other Christian uh, characteristics and qualities and he lifts them all up. Then he also sees it as a conquering quality of the Christian life. A conquering quality in the Christian life. In the book of Romans chapter 12, I want to read two places here if you want to follow. First one is verse 9 and then we're skipping down to verse 20. But in Romans 12, 9, Paul wrote these words, love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. I'm going to tell you, if you're anything like me, you know how difficult it is nowadays to, to go through some of that. It's, it's tough now to, to hate all the evil that we need to hate and cling to all the good to which we should cling. It's just, it's just a different, different world in which we live, and, and we need to do everything we can to practice that. So here's, that was the first thing he tells us. And then as he writes down through the rest of that text there from verse 9 on down through uh, verse 19, he talks about all these different things that we need to be doing. And then uh, he said, you know, one of the things that happens is that people want to return evil for evil. I don't want you to raise your hand, but how many of us here this morning have felt the urge to return evil for evil? I'll raise mine. <laughs> now, I'm going to pronounce all of you innocent, but I pronounced my own guilt this morning because there have been times when I, you know, I would like to return some evil for evil and perhaps even did. I know you find that difficult to believe, but... Uh, But notice what he says in verse 20, Romans 12. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Now, (laughs) immediately if you're like me, you think, boy, I'd like to throw some hot coals at him. That's what I'd like to do. That's not what that's talking about, is it? You will heap burning coals on his head. What he means by that is you will find a way to soften his heart or her heart by doing good. That's the whole premise behind it. If we, if we, you know, if someone's done us wrong and, and, uh, and uh, have, have, have really functioned as an enemy, the thing we want to do is treat them in such a way as to kind of break the barrier d- uh, down and bring it back to where it needs to be. And then, uh, then he, he finalizes it with these words. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, that's sometimes a difficult thing to do, but that's exactly what we've been commissioned to do. Stuart Holden, in his book, Prevailing Intercessory Prayer, tells of being in Egypt and meeting a sergeant in the Highland Regiment. He was a Christian, and so he asked him how he was brought to Christ. And the, the soldier replied, Well, there was the sergeant that is replied, there was a private in my company and he had been converted on the island of Malta in Malta area. And I gave him a terrible time. And he said, I remember one night in particular when it was very rainy and he came in and uh, wet and weary from, uh, from a sent from sentry duty. And yet as usual, when he came in, he got down on his knees before going to bed to pray. And my boots were covered in mud. And so I threw them both at him and hit him in the head twice. And he kept on kneeling and kept on praying. The next morning when I woke up, I found my boots beautifully cleaned and polished by my bedside. This was his reply to me, and it broke my heart. That's the day I was brought to repentance. It isn't easy. It isn't easy. But Paul holds goodness in high esteem because he knows that repaying good for evil will bring about much better change than the other way around. Lastly, then the practical question basically is how can we embrace goodness and display it in our lives? How can we make it happen? Well, first of all, we need to see this goodness as a command that needs to be obeyed. Now, it's it's nice to think of it just as a quality that gets produced by the Holy Spirit, and that's certainly true, but it's a command also to be obeyed. And when Paul wrote to uh, Timothy, in in the sixth chapter of 1 Timothy, Paul talks a lot about money and about materialism. And then in verse 18 of that chapter, here's what he says. Command them, he's speaking of all Christians, all people. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. Now there he's pairing up those words again, notice. Because he's talking about people who are rich and he says, command these folks 
to be rich in good deeds, uh, to do good rather, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Um, I, I, I talk about this often, I know, from up here, and there's so many things I, that I find attractive about, uh, about the Shiva church. But the generosity of the church is one of the things I find extremely attractive. The way the church responds to needs and everything. This morning in the Sunday school class, we, we mentioned a, uh, a mission that we want to send some money to. And I told them, uh, I made a proposal and I said, we'll, t- we'll give this much plus whatever you give today. And people came up and put money in that, you know, like way better than normal because of the generosity. So Paul says, uh, these, it's not the same specific word here for good, but this good refers to righteous behavior. The good deeds refer to righteous actions. The generosity refer, re, refers to sharing with people who are in need, which is the actual definition of the word in Galatians 5, 22, 22 and 23. The second thing we can do is engage ourselves in the practice of this goodness. We receive it as a command, but we engage ourselves in the practice of it. Upright moral behavior, that is good. That's one of the definitions of being good. But also, deeds that need to be done, and gifts that need to be shared. I read about a preacher who was, many of us are like, like this little boy perhaps, I read about a preacher who was teaching a lesson on the 23rd Psalm and, uh, to a group of children, and he noticed that one little boy seemed particularly upset by the phrase, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And so when the the preacher said, what's wrong with that phrase, Johnny? And well, uh, he answered, uh, I understand about having goodness and mercy follow you, but I'm not sure I'd like to have Shirley follow me around all the time. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we think Shirley's following us around all the time instead of goodness and mercy. Here we are. See the goodness as as a command and engage ourselves in the practice of it. Now as it concerns our salvation, some people will rely on their goodness for their salvation. But we know that our goodness, no matter how good it is, is as filthy rags before God. It could never secure us salvation, could it? Salvation is brought about by goodness, but not our goodness, but rather by the goodness of God. And as a fruit of the Spirit, Paul's description of this goodness is that which is produced by the Holy Spirit after we've been granted salvation and the Spirit's indwelling presence comes to us. And the Christian's task, our task as believers in regard to this, is to allow the Holy Spirit to manifest this goodness within our lives. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced this or not, but maybe you've been in a situation where you knew it called for goodness and the spirit was prompting goodness and you fought it. <laughs> I, there's probably been some times in my life when I've fought it. You know, I know I should be good, but, but I'm, I'm going to fight it. You know, Paul says, don't quench the spirit. Don't put out the spirit's fire. When, when, when God's spirit's trying to prompt us to motivate us to do the, do the thing that's good, then make that, let, let that happen. Let that happen. I don't know specifically what that might be in, in your case or in my case, but let it happen. Let it happen. Jesus said, if you call me good, you call me God. And if we think that he's the good shepherd, if we think that he's the good savior, if we think we're ready to surrender our lives to him, we need to understand that uh, it's not just a matter of him being good it's a matter of him being God and when he calls us we respond in kind if you're here today and you don't know the Lord as your savior he's a good shepherd he's a good shepherd he he doesn't want to put any more on us than than we can possibly uh, uh, bear up under he says take my yoke upon you learn me it's a simple it's simple it's not difficult to respond to the love, grace, and mercy of Christ. If you're here today and you need to do that, we're going to give you that opportunity. We're going to stand and sing a hymn of decision. And if you need to uh, respond to him, we encourage you, we invite you to do that as we stand. Would you come?
Thank you so much for your presence this morning. I, I, I had not looked at this. I did not know that this hymn was chosen. I thought that's kind of interesting that we're singing about the shepherd after we've talked about him as being the good shepherd this morning. So God kind of puts all this stuff together. It's like Dennis this morning when he got ready to do his communion meditation. Joe had already read scripture. <laughs> uh, God does some of those things just, just to mess with, it, with, our, with our minds sometimes, I think. And, and uh, uh, kind of trick us a little bit, which is a great thing. Hope you have a blessed week. Hope the Lord will use you in a real special, really special way. That you'll have opportunities to uh, display this wonderful part of the fruit of the Spirit known as goodness this week. Let's bow for benediction and then our closing course. Thank you, Father, for, for being our God and for loving us beyond measure and for sending Jesus Christ to, to be our shepherd, to give his life for us. Father, we know he was the good shepherd. He told us so. He demonstrated it. And we know that this great quality and characteristic of goodness should also be uh, present and prevalent in our lives. And so we ask that through your spirit you will empower us that we might display it to those around us. Not so that we might receive glory ourselves, but so that you might be glorified. Thank you for loving us and meeting our needs through Christ. Keep us safe this week and use us in your service. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.